Good afternoon, and welcome to the February edition of the Council on Aging's monthly meeting. Delighted to have you at the TV audience and to the audience here in the studio. Welcome. We have a wonderful program, so let's get started. <clears throat> Mr. Commissioner Sanchez, would you uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance for us, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Francine, would you call the roll, please? <clears throat> Commissioner Borgie? Here. Commissioner Fotheringham? Here. Here. Commissioner Grimm? Here. Commissioner Healy? Here. Commissioner Loomis? Estoy. Commissioner Norkin? Here. Commissioner Shantas? Yeah. Commissioner Searden? And Commissioner Silverberg? Here. Thank you. Now's our time for public comments. Uh, I don't have any filled out sheets, so I'm assuming there are no public comments. We'll move on to agenda item five, and our first speaker will be Susan Cashman, a very good friend of ours, former Miss Senior California. Welcome, Susan. and I am the director of the Miss Senior Caneo Valley Pageant. Now, I don't know if you remember, some of you do, but last year was our first year here. This, California has several preliminary pageants as part of the Miss Senior California pageant. Because we're such a big state, we have them all the way from San Diego up to Santa Clara. And this was our first year in this venue, and I'm very proud to say, with all the wonderful help I got from Francine, Andrea, uh, H2U Hospital, so many people out here, even the Mayor's City Council had me speak in front of them, that we had 16 contestants and we had a big audience and everybody loved the pageant. This is such a positive experience for senior women. There's only two requirements, one that you must be 60 years of age and or older and you must be a citizen of the United States. So I'm here today to promote and get some contestants going. I have some out. I have lots of contestant applications out right now. But we need contestants. And a talent can be anything. It doesn't have to be musical. It doesn't have to be dramatic. It doesn't have to be dance. It could be poetry. It could be reading. I have one lady that's going to do a reading, one lady that's going to do poetry. Last year we had a couple of ladies that displayed their quilts, which were absolutely magnificent. The point is, that they get in and they do it because when you do it I tell my ladies I promise you only two things one you're going to meet some wonderful women and two you're going to have a lot of fun so without further ado what I did today is I brought a promo of about eight minutes to give you just clips of last year's pageant so you can see what it's like and I have brochures sitting back here if any of you know a sister a grandmother uh, anybody that would like to do it, please encourage them to do it. 
because it, it takes place at the Goebel Senior Center and it'll be May 23rd and two of my judges are sitting there wonderful people so let's get involved and, and fill the pageant up okay are we ready to roll Fairy tales can come true It can happen to you If you're young at heart For it's hard you will find To be narrow of mind If you're young at heart You can go to extremes with impossible schemes You can laugh when your dreams fall apart at the seams And life gets more exciting with each passing day And love is either in your heart or on its way Don't you know that it's worth every treasure on earth to be young at heart For as rich as you are It's much better by far To be young at heart And if you should survive To a hundred and five Look at all you'll derive Out of being alive best part, you have a head start, if you are among the very young at heart. To the first annual Miss Senior Caneo Valley Pageant. Because California is such a big state, it is necessary to hold preliminary pageants starting in San Diego in February and ending in Santa Clara in July. This is our first time at this venue and we are very proud to be here. To a hundred and five, look at all you'll derive out of being alive and here is the best part. Have a head start if you are among the very young at heart. Time for the philosophy of life and formal attire modeling segment. Each of the contestants will be brought on stage by an escort. This is John Abramson, my fantastic companion. Life is for living. What a wonderful time this is in our lives to focus on just about anything that interests us. As seniors, we have so much to offer and enjoy. I've been blessed, and so I feel that it's truly important to give back something to the community. In doing so, I've learned that getting involved is every bit as rewarding as anything I've done in life. Life is for living, and I believe in doing just that. Thank you. The segment that is the most popular with the audience, talent. Each contestant has two minutes and 45 seconds to perform. Are we ready backstage?
You make me feel though spring is sprung And every time I see you grin I'm such a happy individual The moment that you speak I want to go play hide and seek Yes? Somebody, the mayor? Come on up here. I have something for you, Your Honor. Hooray! Welcome the mayor, Tom Glancy, Mayor of Thousand Oaks. Ah, uh, how was the Eagle Scouts? Great. As good as this? No. There you go. <laughs> Do I have to sing a dance? Do you want to? No. <laughs> then you don't have to. Your Honor, I want to give you this. This is in appreciation. The Miss Senior America of California pageant program extends a thank you to the mayor and the city of Thousand Oaks for supporting the Age of Elegance, Miss Senior Caneo Valley pageant, May 31st, 2009. Thank you so much, Your Honor. Thank you for coming. Yes. So, you know, I just want to thank you for your efforts in putting this together. It's uh, it's really great for the community. It's great for seniors, of which I am one. And so uh, I congratulate you on the apparent success of this event, and I wish you quite well in future endeavors. So thank you very much for this. Welcome to our contestants. And the winner is Anna Wimsett. Thank you, Susan. And as uh, one of the fortunate people who got to be one of those judges last year, it's just a hoot. So I, I invite you, whether you want to come down and have a talent or show it, to come to the come to the pageant. It's just a really good time. Okay, we're moving on, and now we get to the very exciting part of our program. We have a uh, most distinguished panel at this point. I'd like to turn the the uh, I'd like to turn the program over to Commissioner Nancy Healy for introductions. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, before I introduce the panel, uh, introduce Susan, who is going to introduce the panel, I just want to say I want to thank all of the panelists for working so hard with me to get everybody here at the same time together. And when I reviewed the bios of these people, it is unbelievable. I mean, I, I just feel like I can trust my heart here anywhere. And as an aside, I am a heart attack survivor. I was diagnosed at the Los Robles ER. They took the immediate treatment that was needed. Um, I'm also a graduate of the successful graduate of the um, the Cerebral's Cardiac Rehab Program. The three years Valentine's Day that I had my first heart attack and I am convinced that due to the care and all I've had it will be my only one and I will never forget more than just the medical treatment but the kindness of the staff when I was there by myself and found I'd had a heart attack so without any further ado let me introduce Susan Poprock to you Susan is going to be our moderator for today uh, she currently serves as the chief 
Chief Nurse Executive and Vice President of Professional Services for the Motion Picture and Television Fund in Woodland Hills. She has over 30 years experience in healthcare and healthcare administration, including critical care, emergency department, women's and children's services, case management, and the Army Nurse Corps. She is currently involved in the design and provision of innovative services for the elderly and leads the Motion Picture Television Motion Picture and Television Fund's Palliative Care Program. Uh, as an additional thing, she was a very recent past member of our Council on Aging, and I am really pleased to welcome you and thank you for participating with us also. Thank you very much. Um, if you're like most people, you probably think that heart disease is a problem for other folks. But according to the CDC, heart disease is the number one killer in the United States. Uh, number one for women, number one for seniors. And this afternoon, we have the privilege of being informed by a panel of experts. Let me introduce them to you. Dr. Vishva Dave is the Director of Cardiology at Los Robles Hospital and Medical Center. His CV is 13 pages long, so I'll try to summarize for you. Uh, he graduated from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi and completed cardiology fellowships there and at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. Dr. Dave has taught cardiology as an assistant professor at both All India Institute of Medical Science and at UCLA. He was the Director of Cardiac Catheterization and Interventional Cardiology at the VA in Los Angeles and has been at Los Robles since 1998 where he served as director of the cardiac cath laboratory as chief of staff and since 2006 as the medical director of cardiovascular services. He has co-authored over 60 peer-reviewed research papers and over 10 chapters on cardiology in different medical uh, books. Welcome Dr. Dave. Mary Linz has been a cardiac rehab nurse at Los Robles since 1996, but she specialized in the care of the cardiac patient as an exercise physiologist long before graduation from Pierce College's uh, nursing program in 1992. Mary has a bachelor's and a master's in exercise physiology from USC, and the combination of these two specialties benefits and complements Los Robles program. Welcome, Mary. Anne Toyama is a psychiatric mental health clinical nurse specialist and the charge nurse in cardiac rehabilitation at Los Robles since 1991, where she is responsible for stress management education and the cardiac support group. Anne received her Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of Santa Clara, her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Mount St. Mary's College, and her Master's in Nursing from UCLA. Welcome, Anne. Neil Baker is the Assistant Regional Director for Mended Hearts, a national nonprofit organization affiliated with the American Heart Association, whose mission is to inspire hope in heart disease patients and their families. Welcome, Neil. <laughs> and, and Neil had an especially long drive today, so thank you very much for making that effort. I'm sure you will probably have questions for our panel, but I'd ask you to just hold them until they've uh, had a chance to present some information to us, and uh, we'll ask for audience questions after that. There are many types of heart disease, and four of them, uh, hypertension, coronary heart disease, ha heart valve disorders, and rhythm disorders are the most common among seniors. A 2008 study published in the Archives of Internal Medicine produced the stunning results that show nearly half the people with a history of heart disease know very little about the symptoms of a heart attack and don't even consider themselves to have an elevated cardiovascular risk. But the effectiveness of therapy for heart conditions is dependent on a patient's quick decision to seek treatment. Dr. Dave, if we could start with you, can you tell us what a heart attack is and uh, what are the symptoms of a heart attack? Very well. Uh, Susan, uh, thank you for that kind uh, introduction first. Uh, a heart attack uh, happens when um, one of the arteries that supplies blood to the heart uh, gets suddenly blocked. So it starts off with a plaque in the artery 
uh, which forms a small clot on top of that and uh, uh, causes the sudden occlusion of blood flow. And um, okay, uh, so usually there are some classical symptoms of heart attack, and those would be uh, severe chest pain in the mid chest area. Many a times they would radiate to both shoulders or one shoulder, to the throat, to the neck, to the jaw, uh, to the back. And they are usually associated also with other symptoms that actually underline the severity and, and uh, seriousness of the situation. Those would be uh, that the person would break out into a cold sweat, would feel very weak, may have shortness of breath. Uh, but the classical symptoms don't occur all the time. In fact, um, uh, people younger than 65 years of age, about 80% will have the classical presentation, the one I, that I described. Uh, seniors have that kind of presentation only about half the time and women have a classical presentation less often than men and senior women particularly uh, may have presentation which is not the classical presentation so a majority of senior women the heart attack would not present with the classical symptoms of chest pain uh, sweating uh, and radiation to the so if you're looking for the classical symptoms, we might miss close to two-thirds of heart attacks in elderly women. Uh, so we need to look for all the symptoms, the entire box of symptoms that, can, um, that could indicate a heart attack. Many times that those symptoms may just be sudden onset and fairly significant severe shortness of breath, uh, not being able to breathe, a choking sensation. Uh, sometimes the symptoms are just profound weakness. Suddenly you wake up in the morning and you feel completely drained uh, and, and break out into a, a drenching sweat. Uh, sometimes uh, people just faint and uh, find themselves extremely weak. In fact, pain anywhere above in the upper half of the body uh, could indicate uh, a heart attack. Pain could be predominantly in the back. Um, could be in the shoulders. Uh, the pain tends to also localize in areas where for some other reason there is what I call a decreased threshold of for pain receptors. Somebody has a bad shoulder, the heart attack pain, pain could localize to that shoulder. A bad tooth, it could go to that tooth. It's a strange uh, system uh, that the body follows. So the point is if you suddenly have a sudden onset of any of these symptoms, uh, shortness of breath, chest pain, chest heaviness, tightness, sometimes burning sensation, which is unusual, uh, you should suspect that may be a heart attack. So those would be the ways that one would look at uh, how to suspect that something is going on. And that's something that uh, we may look for within ourselves or you see your husband or your wife complaining of some with, with their hand on chest and saying, I'm not feeling good today and I think I have heartburn. Very often we need to worry about that heartburn. And that's how mistakes often get made. Well, it sounds as if uh, the symptoms are so variable. Um, what should I do if I think I'm, if I'm not feeling well the way you just described? What kind of things should I be thinking of? Because I've heard that um, you know the quick response to uh, to getting help is very very important. So what help is available? What should I think about? What should I do? Good. I, I think that's the the million dollar question, as we uh, say. If you think that you may be having a heart attack few simple steps to take. One, you should take a, either chew or swallow one or two tablets of aspirin. Data shows that just doing that reduces the mortality and morbidity from heart attack by 22 percent. That's more effective than a lot of invasive things that get done later. That's part one. Two, you need to call for help. We've now established a system in, in Ventura County um, and in some other counties where the best way to de ask for help would be to call 911. You don't want to have somebody drive you to the hospital even if you are close to the hospital. You certainly don't want to drive to the hospital yourself. Uh, and the reason is, once you call 911, 
the paramedics will come to your house, they'll do an EKG, and if that EKG shows that there is a heart attack, based upon that, the paramedics will activate the system in the hospital, which will take care of the heart attack. So by the time the paramedics bring the patient to the emergency room, we already have system in motion. A, there's a 24-7 uh, on-call cardiologist, there's a cath lab available, and we actually started measuring how fast and, and how well we can take care of those patients. And we measured what's called a door to balloon time. The moment you hit the door, till the time that your artery is actually opened and heart attack is stopped. Uh, the process now is so well oiled and works so well. To give you an example, the national goal is to have a door to balloon time of 90 minutes. In the last three years since we started this project, the door to balloon time at your local hospital in Los Robles is now on an average somewhere between 45 to 55 minutes. Data shows faster we open up the blocked artery after a heart attack, faster we stop the damage to the heart muscle. It's like a, an explosion in the center of a forest, for example. The fire starts, but the damage doesn't get done right away. It, occurs, it spreads outwards at a certain pace. Faster you put out the fire, smaller the amount of damage. And that's something that's been worn out with study after study. Fast response, quick resolution of the blockage, and then the heart muscle is not damaged, the patients now on an average will go home with essentially a normal undamaged heart with normal heart function, which is a far cry from what used to obtain not long ago. Ten years ago, substantial uh, number of people would go home after a heart attack with significantly damaged heart. So the, I think the key element is suspecting that somebody has a heart attack. Very often there is a process of denial which is very widespread or just, just my heartburn. Heartburn has is possibly the single most common mistake made. If you don't have a reason to have a heartburn, if you don't have heartburn every day and you certainly have heartburn, it likely is not heartburn. <laughs> Heartburn also doesn't make you sweat, uh, break out into a sweat. It also doesn't make you feel short of breath. It doesn't make you feel so tired. So the point is, a tot total picture, something that comes on suddenly and something that's unusual for that person, uh, we need to suspect that it may be a heart attack and respond to it. Uh, if we have a few more minutes, heart attack occurs in about 1.3 or 1.2 million uh, Americans every year. About 350,000 people every year, in addition, have a presentation of a heart attack in the form of sudden cardiac death. Two-thirds of these happen in seniors. And amongst them, a majority would have presentation that's not the classical. So it's a very substantial population and a very damaging process that needs to be suspected quickly and then uh, ask for help promptly. Call 911 if you think you have a heart attack because before you leave the house the process of taking care of you in your hospital is already started. That's great information and I, I just want to make sure I understood correctly. So the first thing to do if you suspect you're having a heart attack is to take one or two aspirins yes. immediately and then call 911. Right. Don't drive yourself. Certainly. <laughs> okay. Can you tell us, um, I, a heart attack obviously is, is the, the major thing that we're talking about here, but there are a few other types of heart disease common to the senior population, and, and how does that play into our discussion today about heart health? For example, um, hypertension or um, atrial fibrillation, degenerative uh, valve disease, things like that. Well, uh, the the effect of aging on the cardiovascular system, a relatively broad topic, but I think something that is not very well covered in medical schools, uh, you'll be surprised to know. Uh, most of the research trials enroll males between 35 and 65. So most of the data that we say, okay, there is enough data to support this medication, likely doesn't apply to an elderly woman because they have not been enrolled in, the, in those studies. But uh, without uh, diverting too far away from that, uh, 
with age certain things happen two-thirds of the seniors uh, 65 years and older have hypertension two-thirds uh, that's a relatively common and uh, what we call a silent killer and the process of hypertension will affect other it will cause strokes it will cause heart attacks it will cause damage to the kidneys it will cause congestive heart failure all the things that we associate with the uh, elderly population as having increased uh, morbidity and mortality uh, there are now medications available to control high blood pressure which have minimum side effects they are easy, the blood pressure is this day and age easy to control without significant side effects and it's something that needs to be addressed and accepting high blood pressure just a part of aging is not right congestive heart failure uh, the commonest drg in a hospital in the, in, in in the united states that means one diagnosis that covers the admissions the commonest admission uh, cause of admissions in the American hospitals is congestive heart failure. The prevalence of this is about and anywhere above 70 years of age, 4 to 8 percent people would have congestive heart failure. At 85, that ratio is now 15 to 20 percent, and it grows with time. And management of congestive heart failure has also been literally revolutionized in the last 20 years. The outcomes of people who have congestive heart failure, if you compare them today with the current medications, with things that were available 25 years ago, the uh, prognosis is remarkably changed. If you look at the Mayo Clinic's historical data, a lot of people outlive their expected lifespan by 10, 15 years, which is, which is amazing when the lifespan was expected to be one or two years. Uh, the key take home message for congestive heart failure is if you have congestive heart failure you need to watch your salt you need to watch your weight if your weight goes up within a week of more than a pound or two that means you're accumulating fluid that sign that your the medication are not working or something else is going on and you need care there are numerous medications which are otherwise benign but they make congestive heart failure worse very promptly and some of them get prescribed by physicians who possibly don't look at the congestive heart failure part as closely as they're looking at their problem they're trying to deal with. Uh, as you may know, physicians as well tend to become compartmentalized. If I'm a rheumatologist, I'm worried about your hip and your knee joints and I'm focused on giving you treatment for it. But what I'm giving you is likely to make your congestive heart failure worse and that's part that I'm kind of deaf to. Uh, the number of medications, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, which are available over the counter, if you take enough of them, they will make your congestive heart failure worse. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents will cause salt and water retention. They also affect kidneys adversely. They also increase your blood pressure. So something that looks like innocuous enough to be on the shelves of a self-service pharmacy is not necessarily completely innocuous. There are also things uh, that we treat, use to treat other conditions, uh, diabetic, uh, diabetic medications. Many of them will make congestive heart failure worse. The point is, you need to stay alert to that, and we as physicians need to stay alert to that. However, I think each one of us, so when you go to your doctor, ask him, is any of these medications likely to make my other problems worse? A very fair question, and you may be surprised by the answer. So that's, I think in nutshell, that's what the take home message for congestive heart failure should be. There are numerous medications, there are new devices, there are new uh, non-surgical techniques which help the overall prognosis of congestive heart failure. But uh, we, I think in the, in the a sense of time, we'll just cover some of the basics on, on um, some of the other common problems that, that happen in the elderly. The other common problem uh, which many of you may be aware of or may be afflicted by is atrial fibrillation. Now atrial fibrillation is an arrhythmia which is very common in the elderly. Uh, it's strangely age related. 8% uh, of the population greater than 70 years of age has atrial fibrillation uh, which is very common by uh, all other criteria. And atrial fibrillation is a condition where the upper chambers of the heart don't contract. 
they just fibrillate just like that. The lower chambers are able to deal with the, the requirements of blood flow to the body, so it's not a lethal arrhythmia. However, because the upper chambers don't contract, the blood flow becomes stagnant in the corners, the what we call an appendage of the left atrium, which is like a little um, a closet. And the blood flow there then forms blood clot. And when the moment the blood clot puts its head out with the flow, it gets swept across and then that clot flies in the body like a bullet, ready to close an artery and cause problems. The commonest problem then related to atrial fibrillation is the occurrence of strokes. And that kind of puts that in perspective as to how significant that is for, an, for the elderly. I know uh, the stroke is one of the most dreaded things that can happen to anybody. And for that, uh, the atrial fibrillation needs to be treated with blood thinners. And many of you may be familiar with Coumadin. It's one of the oldest drugs that we use. And strangely, one area where we haven't made much headway. Uh, we haven't had a substitute for Coumadin, which is, uh, as everybody knows, is a rat poison. But it's, uh, it's the only and a very beneficial drug. But it, 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 it has remarkable limitations. The limitations are that one, it works indirectly. So it takes about a week or two for its effect to become fully effective. Then it needs to be monitored, and for no rhyme or reason, its levels in blood can fluctuate. So your blood may become too thin or too thick without you doing anything different. You can take the same dose, and it'll still uh, check the blood and it looks weird. That's why it's not a good medication, but that's the only one available. And it, the data supporting permanent use in atrial fibrillation is very strong. So it truly is a beneficial drug if taken properly. On the other hand, if it's not monitored well, then it's a dangerous drug. Uh, the other thing to be, to, to be careful about when you're taking uh, Coumadin for atrial fibrillation is um, that uh, numerous medications interact with it. So another checklist, atrial fibrillation, you again want to check your medications with your physician. Does any of these medications interfere with my Coumadin levels, make it worse, make it better? vitamin K intake, so dietary advice. And there are of course newer uh, devices that can, that are on the horizon where we can actually plug up that appendage, that the closet, just close it, shut its door in a way. It doesn't have a door, so you have to put a door there. Uh, and there are devices that you can actually uh, introduce uh, percutaneously through, through the groin, uh, through the vein, and uh, close the appendage so that the mischief maker is shut off. Now, those are still, but it's a, it's a procedure now. Uh, we're still weighing the relative benefits of those procedures versus an ablation procedure to get rid of atrial fibrillation compared to the standard the Coumadin therapy. So uh, that's the essentially state of uh, the art on um, atrial fibrillation. It's a relatively common problem. Strokes are the common uh, associated things uh, that we worry about and Coumadin is essentially the only established treatment. So the other area that I think we may uh, touch briefly and that's again what I call in big terms, uh, in big picture, uh, degenerative diseases. That's the valvular degeneration. Uh, with time, we know that uh, the heart valves, for example, open and close 60, 70, 80 times a minute, as many times as your heart beats. Uh, so imagine something that starts beating at, 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 uh, in utero f four months before birth and continues to do that all your life. Uh, there is some wear and tear involved with it. Um, and those things get worn out with time. And uh, strangely, uh, the thing that causes, accelerates the wear and tear is, uh, is cholesterol. We found that progression of valvular degeneration as is reduced by lowering cholesterol, and that's about the only thing that lowers the, the wear and tear down the line. And it's a important side benefit that we learned when we were treating people with statins. Uh, aortic stenosis which is the valve that gets 
affected with age uh, most commonly becomes blocked in people 80 years or older the prevalence of critical aortic stenosis so tight that it doesn't let the blood flow through it the valve area is reduced to one-fifth or one-sixth of normal uh, occurs in about two percent of the population another eight percent has uh, intermediate degree of blockage and those people can expect the intermediate degree of blockage to get worse in the next eight to ten years so the problem with our society's growth and the aging population is we are going to have these potentially lethal and potentially treatable conditions occurring at a relatively vulnerable age in the 90s and 90s are going to be a lot more prevalent than we are used to right now so and that also brings up the issue about the healthcare budgeting and expenses uh, but the good thing is purely from the medical perspective and I never put my accounting hat on because I don't have to and it's not my territory we know that there are good things in the on the horizon uh, aortic stenosis for example if we have within the next few years we could be treating aortic stenosis in people who are otherwise in reasonably good health and there are many people in reasonably good health in their 90s who would not be considered surgical candidates to replace the valve percutaneously without surgery which is uh, a big deal considering anybody who has seen anybody with open heart surgery how, how how uh, big a trauma to the body it is and how long it takes for the recovery to happen and at that age at any age uh, surgery is something that you make a down payment first in the hope that you're going to reap the rewards down the line at 95 96 you don't know how long you'll have to reap the rewards beyond that so you don't want to pay too much of a down payment <laughs> so you want, you want something that is relatively uh, low risk you say okay I'm not putting down payment right <laughs> Uh, and uh, that's why relatively non-invasive procedures, whether they are stents for blocked arteries in the heart, stents for the carotid arteries uh, that cause stroke, stents that have valves mounted for stent uh, valve replacement, those things are all here and available uh, and would become more and more widely used as these degenerative conditions become uh, more and more cumulatively larger in amount as we have larger and larger population of people in older age group. It's not good news for the healthcare reform but uh, it's great news for our seniors and I think uh, as long as we stay alert to the fact that heart disease can happen in all of us and we don't stay in a state of denial if we have chest pain we call for help non call it heartburn and t take thumbs and sleep over it and if we have other problems like high blood pressure instead of saying oh I don't want to take any medications I never took medications but then you were never 75 years of age before <laughs> so uh, we need to deal with those medic uh, the, those treatments and the, the truth is there is great quality of care and therapeutic interventions now available uh, diet good diet good exercise uh, and taking care of your health. I think those are the key issues. And I would end with a famous, uh, a, not famous, a very commonly used um, example that one of my friends uh, uses often. Once you decide to do something, exercise or quitting smoking or uh, s taking strict uh, diet or losing weight, you need to get up and do it because just deciding is not enough. And that's the story that's uh, seven uh, birds on a wire the story goes like this so the seven birds on a wire one decides to fly how many are left behind it's a catch question still seven because deciding to fly is not equal to flying <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, that was truly fascinating, and you made it so understandable with all of your analogies. Thank you so much, Dr. Dave. I, I, uh, I particularly paid attention when you talked about um, informing your doctor about over-the-counter medications and asking about diet. Those are things that are often forgotten, and, and that's so important. And uh, it sounds to me as if uh, a good cardiologist is probably one of our best friends at this age, too. So thank you. Thank you. Mary. Um, I understand that, that cardiac rehabilitation is, is a supervised program to help heart patients recover quickly and improve their overall functioning. But, you know, when I think about it, I think I'd be nervous about exercising after a heart attack. How does, how does heart disease affect my activity or vice versa? It is a frightening thing. After you're told by the cardiologist that you have to go exercise, it leaves you in question of, how do I go about doing that? Am I okay? Am I going to, is my heart going to stop? Am I able to push myself beyond that point where I feel a little breathless? And it leaves you with a lot of questions. So cardiac rehab is an avenue that a lot of cardiologists use. It's not just to go and exercise, but we also have educational classes. The edu educational classes go into uh, how to go about exercise, how medications actually affect your exercise the type of exercise that you do that is going to benefit the heart the most. So when a cardiologist tells you to go exercise, that's one of the resources he uses is cardiac rehab, that you can actually go through a guided program. You're going to be on a monitor. The monitor actually shows if there's any irregular rhythms. We report to the doctor, and of course he can take care of them in a, in a preventative manner. The other thing it does is it, it actually tracks what's going on with your blood pressure with exercise and without exercise, if the medications are indeed effective or if you might need some changes in them. After you do the blood pressure, the other thing is how are you feeling? Do you feel tired? Are you improving in how you're responding to exercise? All of those are important factors with regards to how you progress. There are three principles that you want to follow with regards to starting your exercise program. If you're at home and you were told to exercise but yet cardiac rehab is not an option, the three principles you want to start out with are frequency, intensity, and duration. The frequency that you want to maintain is Three to four times a week would be your minimum time frame that you would want to exercise. The intensity is going to be the level at which you're going to maintain your heart rate during that exercise time period. And the frequency, the intensity, and duration. The duration is going to be 45 to 60 minutes. We want to make sure, when we talk about frequency, I said three to four times, make sure that we're actually going to a goal of six times a week. Change up your activities. The type of things that you do, you want to make sure that you enjoy doing them. If you walk and you have a normal course that you take, make sure that you change that course frequently. It adds for a little bit of variety to your muscles, as well as what we call cross-training. Cross-training is something that is utilizing different muscle groups. So if you're walking and you change that up to another option of that activity, something such as cycling one day a week, you will find that your body burns more calories and your heart gets a different benefit from it as a result. Now the intensity that you're going to maintain during your exercise time period is going to be according to following what your heart rate is doing. We can monitor your heart rate in the cardiac rehab. You'll be on a monitor to do so. If you're at home, you can also take your heart rate, either with one of the uh, heart rate monitors that you can purchase at the sports kind of athletic stores, or you can use your two fingers, and there's a place on your thumb at your radial artery or along the neckline, and count the beats that you are going to be counting during exercise. You want to exercise according to what your cardiologist has told you. Normally, it's called a target heart rate zone. That target heart rate zone is defined as 70 to 85 percent 
of your maximum heart rate. Now, if you've had a cardiac event, you've had probably a maximum treadmill test, and your cardiologist, some of you are shaking your heads, your cardiologist may have spoken with you as to what pace you should maintain or what heart rate you should maintain during exercise. And you can monitor your own heart rate by taking your pulse. Now, during that time frame, when I say 70 to 85 percent, that is really just taking the maximum heart rate that the heart can even beat and subtracting or taking from there 70 to 85 percent of that maximum heartbeat. So you would use the number 220, subtract your age, that would give you your maximum heart rate, and then take 60 to 85 percent of that. If you are on a beta blocker, which many times after any kind of a cardiac event, the cardiologist will place you on a beta blocker. It is a classification of a medicine, as Dr. Dave responded to, and it is given for either blood pressure control, for irregular rhythms, it may also be given for, also increased heart rate. Whatever the reason that the cardiologist gave you, the guidelines of exercising with a beta blocker are the same. When you're on a beta blocker, you take your resting heart rate, that means the heart rate that you're sitting in a chair, and add 40 beats. So for example, if you're sitting in a chair and the heart rate is at 60, add 40 beats, that heart rate would be about 100 while you're exercising. That would be the guideline at what you should keep your heart rate at during exercise. Now, what we also like to use is something called rate of perceived exertion. And that's simply, how are you feeling during the time you're exercising? Not just your heart rate, but how do you feel? Do you feel fatigued? Even though your heart rate is where it should be and it's not above where it should be, but you feel fatigued, you feel extremely short of breath, you listen to that. that are, those are guidelines. That is something that we want to encourage you or teach you actually through cardiac rehab. Listening to your body is very important in your progression of exercise. So the frequency that you're going to be doing it is four to six times a week. The intensity will vary depending on if you are on a beta medication or not. Now, the time frame that you're going to be exercising should be between 45 and 60 minutes would be your goal. If you have never exercised in your life, that seems like a very long time. <laughs> so I always have, start with very short goals, short-term goals. If you're in a parking lot and you're going to the store, park at the far end of the parking lot. Start with short-term goals. That could be a five-minute walk to the entry of the store. That's your starting point. Progress it by approximately five minutes a week. Five minutes a week would gradually get you to a point of 45 to 60 minutes in a short period of time. And you want to make sure that you listen and pay attention to those symptoms that we talked about of shortness of breath. Are you having, having any chest pain? Make sure you pay attention to those symptoms and report them to your cardiologist if you get them during exercise. Do not think of the aspect, you've all heard the term no pain, no gain. That is not accurate anymore, especially when we talk about hearts. No pain, no gain is not accurate. So if you're feeling pain, whether it be in the muscles, whether it be in the chest area, whether it be in the neck, do not continue your exercise. Some even have a little bit of blockage uh, at times uh, at their leg area. They may have, not just in the heart can you get the blockage, but you may get it in your leg. And we find sometimes people say, gosh, my calves really hurt. As I start to exercise, my calves are hurting on a regular basis. After I start to exercise, 10 minutes into it, my calves hurt. That's something to pay attention to. Don't try to walk through that. That would be something that you should bring up to your cardiologist and let him evaluate that. That is something that can actually get corrected. And exercise is a good thing to improve those conditions. So when you're looking at uh, the intensity, the intensity, as we said, we want to pay attention to what our heart is doing at the pace of it, the heart rate. You want to also pay attention to how you're feeling. Are you feeling exerted? You want to push yourself just beyond that point of comfort, but not to the point where you feel pain. If you are actually exercising, start with just five minutes. If that's all you can start with, continue yourself up to 60 minutes. 
Now, if you have CHF or what we call congestive heart failure, there are a couple things that you want to remember as you're exercising or approaching exercise. Congestive heart failure is, as Dr. Dave said, it's a, an accumulation of excess fluid around the heart. And sometimes you will find that that will leave a little bit more of a challenge for the heart to beat during the excess fluid in your body. You do not want to place excess challenge on the heart by trying to do a tremendous amount of exercise. But you do want to exercise. So that's where you have to listen to your body and modify the exercise depending on how you are feeling for that day. If you are having excess fluid and you've worked with your cardiologist with regards to having either a diuretic or a medication that takes off that weight, you want to make sure that you modify the pace at which you are working and the intensity during that time while the fluids are too high. If you're an atrial fib, the same aspect goes. You want to make sure that you talk to your cardiologist because the heart rate that you will keep during exercise will be a little different than the guidelines that we gave. You will no longer be at 40 beats above rest. The cardiologist will give you those beats with regards to how fast you want to make sure that you keep your heart rate during exercise. Cardiac rehab will also give you those guidelines as well. Um, but when we talk about exercise, the strength of the heart, the reason the cardiologist actually wanted you to go to cardiac rehab or start an exercise program is to strengthen the heart muscle. It's a muscle, just like any other part of the body, you have to work it out. We can't lift weights with our heart. So exercise is done by what we call aerobic exercise, continuous activity that is aerobic. That's the best way to decrease your risk factors for heart disease as well as improve heart disease. Aerobic exercise is defined as something that is greater than 15 minutes of activity as a continuous activity. Walking, cycling, swimming, biking, all of those activities are considered very good in regards to decreasing your risk factors for heart disease. Well, thank you, Mary. Um, you've convinced me that uh, that I am going to fly this week <laughs> to exercise, <laughs> but also that um, I think I would definitely want to have a supervised program at first, and, and I appreciate your words about that. Thank you very much. Anne, moving to your specialty, I, I would imagine that there's a certain amount of fear and worry if you've had any kind of heart procedure or heart disease. Can you tell us a little bit about the emotional challenges associated with heart disease? There is a range of um, emotions and feelings that patients that are dealing with any kind of heart diagnosis, whether it be bypass surgery, recovering from a heart attack, um, being diagnosed with congestive heart failure, um, a number of uh, symptoms that they may be experiencing. These range from denial, which Dr. Dave alluded to, anger, feelings of loss, uh, feelings of uh, feeling out of control, and, and many feelings of fear. These are all considered part of the normal recovery process, and it actually is important for folks to go through these uh, stages and feelings and experience them, because it's only through experiencing them and moving through them that you can get to final resolution and kind of acceptance of your disease, and that will take you to taking the medications and doing the necessary things um, that are needed to take care of uh, your heart problem. How the cardiac diagnosis and your recovery process impacts your life depends on who you are and there's quite a range of this um, impact on someone's life. It can range from, if I can borrow from say the Richter scale, it can range from say a person who's had a heart attack, perhaps that person was a bit active but now is having to take medications, uh, works through some of these feelings, gets active again, is able to get back to work and, and uh, go about his, his life. On the other end of this uh, continuum then might be someone who has a cardiac event, say a heart attack, um, may have had a history of depression, might be a smoker, so now needs to stop smoking, needs to lose weight. It's really having difficulty <coughs> dealing with their feelings of loss, feelings of fear. They may live alone. They may not have as good of a support system. So for that person, their experience of their cardiac diagnosis and their recovery is felt more like a 7.5 on that life impact scale. And then we have every everything in between there. And in cardiac rehab, we do see this continuum 
spectrum, from one end of the spectrum to the other. Most of the feelings that patients have do resolve with time uh, when they learn about their disease, when they take their medications, they're able to move through it, and with time are able to carry on uh, you know, a normal life. Some of the common emotions that are dealt with and I'd like to speak about today um, are under the uh, headings of fear. I'm going to stick with fear and loss. There's a lot of places you could go with this, uh, but in the interest of time, I will speak about fear. Um, some of the fears that our patients deal with is the most obvious one when you're diagnosed with a heart problem. Instinctively, you think, my mortality. It's the first time for many people they've put, you know, smack dab in front of their face, come to grips with their sense of being mortal. Uh, it's an emotional awakening of sorts for some people, and they are um, forced to look at the inevitability of their own death. Uh, for seniors, um, we, we're knowing that seniors are aging, and they're aging a lot more with a lot greater health than they have ever before. So even though we will have patients come in that may be getting along in years, this still may be their first really uh, look at their own mortality. And then there are other seniors who may have some other medical conditions that they've been dealing with, and then layered on this then comes a heart, heart event of some kind. And for them, then the fear comes up boy, is this going to be the unraveling of my health? Is this going to be kind of my final final demise? And they're afraid that they'll never then recoup and get back to their, their current state of health. And that can be very frightening for the seniors. There's also uh, just fears that come with the symptoms that patients experience. Dr. Dave spoke about the, the various symptoms that you can have in your chest area and, ab and above your waist, and there does tend to be this hyper-focus on the chest area, whether that be from an incision, if you've had uh, some kind of bypass surgery, whether you are wondering if you have angina, the chest pain that Dr. Dave was talking about, uh, whether you've been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation and you feel a fluttering in your chest, there's all this concern about about what is this and what am I feeling and it does bring up a lot of anxiety for our patients. Congestive heart failure is also another area uh, that brings up fears for patients. The mere diagnosis, congestive heart failure, the word failure is really quite, quite ominous um, and it really brings up a sense of imminent death for patients as though they're on their deathbed. And much like Dr. Dave said, there are all types of new medications that are available. Patients are living quite long and with quite good quality of, of uh, health into their uh, later years with the diagnosis of congestive heart failure. So it's important to get that clarified. Um, there's new devices also out that are also a source of anxiety for patients. Uh, one is called an implantable cardiac defibrillator. And this is a device that's implanted in a patient's chest. And its purpose is to detect a life-threatening arrhythmia and to discharge and uh, allow the heart to get back on track into a normal, normal rhythm. And so patients that are living with these devices have quite a bit of anxiety because at any point in time, this, uh, this device could discharge and everything that goes along with that psychologically, the fact that they would have died had that this, uh, excuse me, this device not discharged, is, uh, sets up for a lot of fears in these patients. Uh, loss is another area that patients have um, multiple feelings about, and there are losses on various levels. One is a loss just obviously of their health. There's a sense that they kind of have to let go of their prior level of, of health if they saw themselves as a kind of a, a whole person or healthy, and now they've been diagnosed maybe for the first time with a, a heart problem. Um, also loss of physical function, and this can be temporarily just post-operative post or because of heart damage. In any event, patients are, are not able to do their routine tasks and activities that they're used to doing. Um, along with this uh, change in physical function is affects sense of how they see themselves. Their body images change. So whether it's a, an incision, a sternal incision, both men and women don't like this, and it changes who they are as as people, how they look. Uh, to whether it's uh, just lack of conditioning that happens from inactivity. Um, many of our patients, it's quite common on their first visit, they're really distressed about their loss of muscle tone and strength, and they'll appear at their 
first session holding out their arms, just worried about this flesh hanging here that used to be a muscle and wondering if they're ever going to get it back. And these are all some of the losses that they experienced um, with this diagnosis of heart disease. Another one is um, the role changes that occur when you're diagnosed. Um, many of our seniors, uh, because of the downturn in the economy, um, are having to work. Many of them are still working full time. So when they are, are struggling with the heart problem, there is that change, uh, stoppage of work. With that can be the income that, that is stopped as well. And if they're not working, our seniors are very active. They're, if they're not working, they're volunteering. They're involved in their city council. They're on committees. And they uh, really experience this as a loss when they're not able to, to partake in the activities that help define them and help um, add to who they are. So these feelings are um, many, and they are normal. They do resolve, like I said. But they can continue, and this is an important thing that I want to get across, is that if, these, if you are having these feelings, if they are coupled, say, with uh, an onset of more negative thinking, if you're tending to withdraw from social activities, if activities that used to bring you pleasure you're not interested in as much anymore, if you're experiencing these on a daily basis and it goes on for more than two weeks, then it's time to talk to your doctor. It's time to seek help. You can speak with your cardiologist your primary physician, certainly the cardiologists know that this is a very prevalent condition. It is the most common cardiac condition for um, the most, excuse me, the most common psychological condition that affects the cardiac population is depression. And its prevalence among various heart conditions runs 15 to 20 percent. So if you are experiencing these symptoms, you do want to bring this to your doctor's attention. He will either refer you to a mental health specialist. He may uh, start you on a safe antidepressant. Um, he may start some counseling through the mental health therapist so that you can work through these feelings. A, a point about depression and the need for medication I want to bring up. Many people feel, I believe, that depression is somehow a, a character flaw, a weakness of some kind. And so to pay attention to it, to deal with it, is uh, in some way a weakness and something that you shouldn't be doing. And in fact, it's, it's very much a, can be a part of this recovery process, not so much a character flaw. And the need for medication should not be looked at as a stigma because we know that there are biochemical changes that occur in the brain that require some medications to change and, and correct them. And that's why the need for antidepressants. And you don't want to borrow someone's antidepressant because they're only safe antidepressants. Um, there are some that can actually worsen your cardiac condition. So you want to make sure and get the safe ones prescribed by your physicians. It's important to treat depression um, for a number of reasons. Depression uh, can get worse if it's untreated. It can cycle down and can get worse. We know that there can be further cardiac complications and further uh, cardiac events in depression that's not treated. And we also know that depressed patients are going to be less compliant with their uh, medical therapy. They are less apt to take their medications, they're less apt to exercise, and less apt to be compliant with their diets. I know in cardiac rehab we're often calling our patients that we know are suffering from depression to get them to come on into cardiac rehab. So that's another reason why you don't want to let your depression, if you think you are depressed, go unchecked. So how to keep from having your cardiac condition impact your life like a 7.5 earthquake? Number one, get information. Today, if you're all here, this is wonderful. You're getting informed. You're understanding what your heart uh, condition is about. You want to know what, why are you taking your medications? What are they for? We're hearing today there can be some serious side effects and, and um, cross effects if you're taking the wrong medication. So do, do get informed. The other thing is to get talking. And by this, I mean start sharing your feelings. If you've had a cardiac event, you're expected to have some of the emotions that I've talked about. So you want to make sure and share these. It's really difficult to make sense of your feelings and your thoughts if you're just keeping them inside. It's much more helpful if you can share them with someone. And also you want to get connected. You want to start reaching out, um, whether it be joining a cardiac rehab program, coming 
to a cardiac support group, which we have. We have a cardiac support group. You do not have to be part of cardiac rehab to attend the cardiac support group. It is open to the community. We meet on the second Thursday of every month. It's at 3 o'clock in the afternoon over at the East Campus. And a little caveat that with that, we're, we will not be holding the February meeting, but again in March we'll be starting again. It's very unusual. We hold it monthly um, very regularly. And another thing is to get active. Mary spoke about that. And there's all kinds of research that talks about the benefits of exercise combating depression. It's associated with more positive mood states. It helps build confidence, increases endorphin release. So it's really important to get, to get active. Anne, I've, I've heard you say before that uh, you think there might be a silver lining in the cloud of heart disease. Can you um, expand on that a little bit and tell us what you mean? Yes, this is a phenomena that um, we talk a lot about in our cardiac support group. It also comes up in cardiac rehab among, among patients. And what it is is oftentimes when patients have been diagnosed um, with, you know, they've had a heart event of some kind, they've worked through the feelings, they've um, started doing the necessary lifestyle changes, they're often able to look back over it or to even verbalize that, gosh, this has really been a chance for me to stop. Whether you're working or your busy lives, it actually just halts you and it gives you a chance to look and reevaluate your lives. Patients get a chance to reprioritize how they're spending their time, how they're spending their money. Many times uh, significant changes are made in their lives based on this reevaluation. So many of our patients look at it as a second chance. Many of them decide to, to ultimately retire. Some decide to go back and start consulting. Others start volunteering. In any event, there are some uh, changes. They start perhaps spending more time with their grandparents. But much like re restructuring after an earthquake, the infrastructure is oftentimes, most times, stronger than it was prior. That's what the hope is with, with, uh, with heart disease and with processing it, is that you can go on to live a more meaningful life. Thank you so much. Those were profound comments. <laughs> Neil, your um, Mended Hearts, uh, tell us about the services and the support that your program offers to those of us affected by heart disease. I'd like to start off by saying um, one of the things that we do not do and that is we do not give any medical advice. The, and I, I'd like to continue on with what Anne and her cardiac support group does. We are the largest national organization with a patient-to-patient community-based support group for heart people who've had heart problems. We currently do not have a chapter here in this Thousand Oaks, Simi Valley, North um, Los Angeles area, but we do have 256 community-based chapters around the United States, including two in Canada. And we support 430 hospitals that have cardiac programs within those hospitals. What we do is we do a patient-to-patient -patient type visitation and we also have chapter meetings once a month uh, like Anne's group does. Our closest chapter is up in Ventura at the Community Memorial Hospital and it's on the first Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. and any person who has either had a heart event or is a support for a person who has had a heart event is welcome to come. I can give out to any of the people who are here additional information on that. Our main purpose and what we were originally established to do was to visit heart patients in the hospital after they had had open heart surgery. Dr. Harder started with a unit 
back in New England over 50 years ago. And the organization has grown since that time to what it is today. Our visits in the hospital are by people who have had heart events. They are people who have had open heart surgery. They are people who have been trained in visitation and they are checked annually and updated with any new procedures. They are all usually volunteers of the hospital that they are supporting. We, as the others in the panel have indicated, heart disease is something that seems to be growing here in the United States. And a lot of it is due to the ob obesity that is a major problem in the United <laughs> States. Many of our heart patients are also diabetics and we provide an outlet for these people to talk about their problems and to listen to those who have had similar problems. But again, I emphasize we do not give medical advice, but we listen and we will talk about our recovery and uh, how we feel today and try to alleviate any of the concerns of depression, of fear that Ann talked about that seem to be very common with people who do have heart events. Nine cardiovascular defects per 1,000 live births are expected, which means about 36,000 infants per year in the U.S. have congenital heart defects. A few years ago, we started an organization called Mended Little Hearts. It has now become an independent organization. It's still affiliated with the Mended Hearts organization, just as Mended Hearts is affiliated with American Heart Association. We are not part of American Heart Association. But our whole purpose is a volunteer, patient-to-patient -patient type of giving back to people who have heart problems by those who have had heart problems. Thank you so much. Um, I think the important message um, that you delivered to us today is that um, support is available. You're not alone. And thank you for reminding us about all of the children. As grandparents, we can um, certainly take that to heart and be aware of it. As seniors, we get so involved in our own stuff all the time with the medical, and we don't think about that. Well, I think that um, I'm sure that you and the audience here and at home have found this as informative as I have. And thanks to um, each of you, Dr. Dave, um, Mary Linz, and Toyama, and Neil Baker, for an absolutely outstanding um, conversation about heart health and uh, enlightening us this afternoon. And thank you to Commissioner Nancy Healy for coordinating this program. And with the council's indulgence, I would ask the audience if they have any questions at this point. <laughs> Thank you, guys. If if somebody wanted to get involved locally, I know you said that there was no local chapter of Mended Hearts. Is there a website they could go on to or something? Yes, there is. Okay. As a matter of fact, I have my card with me, and you're welcome to call me or email me, or you're welcome to email our national office. We have a very small national office. Uh, I think it's about four paid people who comprise the total paid people within our huge organization. The rest of us are all volunteers. I do hope to establish, and it's been a hope and a challenge to me, to establish a chapter here in Thousand Oaks. Um, we usually start out with someone or a group of people who are interested. We get the support 
of the cardiology department of the local hospital. The hospital actually asks many times that we start a chapter. And then during the first year or so, it's treated as a satellite and it becomes a part of a nearby chapter. In this case, it would be the Ventura chapter. And uh, they aren't responsible, therefore, for having a whole bunch of officers and committee members and the rest of it. Once they reach 38 people, then they can become a chapter in their own and uh, be independent. But yes, I do hope that a chapter can be formed here, and I will diligently work with anyone who is concerned in establishing a chapter. Thank you very much, and thank you for your long drive. Neil drove all the way in. What, how long did it take you? It was exactly 120 miles, and it took exactly two hours. Good <laughs> driving. OK. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So if anybody is interested, you could contact the Council on Aging if you didn't get all that in uh, either being part of a chapter or whatever, and I'm sure we could get you in touch with Neil. So yes. thank you. OK. There's a question here. First of all, I want to say it was wonderful hearing everything you said about heart disease. My husband has had two open heart surgeries, and so the more I can learn, the better I am. You mentioned about taking one or two aspirins uh, if you are feeling that you're going to have a heart attack. First of all, would that be an 81 milligram, uh, the baby aspirin? And also, would the chewable be better than um, the regular uh, to swallow? Uh, that's a good question. Um, if you have not been taking aspirin, then it's wise to take the larger dose of aspirin. Aspirin is a little mysterious drug. Uh, what aspirin does is actually chemically acetylates the platelets in the body. Once you have certain amount of aspirin in your system, you just require a very small dose of aspirin, maybe 81 or maybe even less than that. The side effects of aspirin are dose related. The, all the things that you may have heard about bleeding, um, in this, uh, the peptic ulcer disease and bleeding from the ulcers, those are all dose related. Uh, however, if you take 81 milligrams aspirin, it takes longer for the aspirin to become effective. So the platelets need to be aspirinized or acetylated. So if you have not been taking aspirin and you, have, you think you have a heart attack, you should take two full tablets of aspirin and chewable would be better. They get absorbed faster and you can choose. Swallowing may become a difficult thing at that time doing all the anxiety and stress of uh, having the problem. So uh, that's, I think, the simple uh, good way of uh, dealing with aspirin. But aspirin is invaluable uh, in the setting of a heart attack. Just one comment, if I could make, uh, regarding Neil's uh, mended hearts extension. Los Robles Hospital does have a very vibrant com uh, volunteer program. And in fact, uh, the same kind of services are currently provided by some volunteers who have had hearts, their own hearts mended. Uh, but uh, I'm sure there uh, could be a very easy system of formalizing it. And you have a wonderful uh, organization and a support system which could help. So uh, if you could call me and I would be happy to put you across to uh, somebody in the hospital who could actually help uh, organize it. Thanks, Dr. Dev. I, uh, well. We just went to a volunteer meeting, and you have probably the best volunteer program ever going. So I will probably follow up with you and maybe Neil, and we can see what we can utilize together. So thank you Absolutely. very much. You're very welcome. I have two questions to the doctor. First of all, I would like to know, uh, you mentioned taking aspirin. If a person is on Coumadin, how fast the aspirin uh, affects the PT if you have a heart attack with the aspirin? My second question is that if you are a provider for a person who ha who is a heart patient, and if that person has a heart attack, 
how beneficiary it is that to apply CPR till the ambulance arrives. Very good. Uh, so there are two uh, different questions. The first question is, how do we deal with aspirin in somebody who already is on Coumadin? That's a little difficult uh, situation. Uh, in the 1970s, there was a paper published from Mayo Clinic which showed combining aspirin with Coumadin increased the risk of bleeding. However, at that time, the dose of aspirin being used was somewhere between 650 milligrams to 1300 milligrams. One full tablet of aspirin is 325. Uh, we have combined, and there is a large body of data, combining long-term 81 milligram aspirin use with Coumadin and it's safe. Uh, in, a, in a setting where somebody is on Coumadin and has possibly is having a heart attack, uh, taking a 325 milligram dose, uh, one or even two tablets would be safe under those circumstances because there is a blood clot being formed despite being on Coumadin. And it's possible that um, the Coumadin was not good enough. Uh, however, the heart attacks are related to platelets. They are not related to, they are not prevented by Coumadin, strangely. Uh, so I would think as a one-time event, it's safe to take aspirin along with Coumadin. The second question is uh, regarding CPR and uh, the assumption is that the person has had cardiac arrest and that's a separate and good topic. Uh, cardiac arrest happens fairly commonly in the setting of a heart attack. Commonly meaning it's not uh, 5 to 10 percent patients with heart attack would have a cardiac arrest. Um, at that time providing CPR is absolute essential. And it's, that's why it's important that um, kids at school, um, parents at home, everybody should learn basics of CPR. Uh, and the basics are you want to provide, and it's A, B, C, airway, breathing, and then circulation. In that order, it sounds some, why is it strictly that order? Because establishing airway is the key. Somebody uh, is out and is laying on his back and throws up, he's going to aspirate and block the airways. You need to turn that person to the side uh, while they're vomiting so that it can clear off and it's not uh, it's not obstructing the airways. Then the moment that part is clear, you know the person is not retching or vomiting, they need to be on their back. Then what you need to do is start giving cardiac massage with stretched hands, one hand over the other, just like this, on the chest, and then bend on your, on your, uh, from your back and go down with full weight. Uh, and if you do just that, that enough uh, moves the chest cavity enough to produce enough ventilation. So if you just did that at a certain rate that you can do physically, uh, you don't have to be very fast. Uh, one in one per second or one in two, uh, one per two seconds is good enough initial starting point uh, while the paramedics come. You could give, uh, uh, if the primary problem is breathing, somebody drowned, uh, the heart was okay, then you could give mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth breathing if you think it's safe. Uh, but just cardiac massage gives enough ventilation as well. When the paramedics come, they of course, first thing that they would do is put an ambu bag and give few quick breaths and then start the CPR. Uh, and that's a process that, uh, that needs to be, uh, to, to be uh, obtained. And we actually have, this is a relatively, obviously a big uh, major problem. And we've recently, we're planning on starting a, a system-wide, again a county-wide system, uh, where we would actually, somebody who requires, has cardiac arrest, gets resuscitated, the pulse comes back, but the person is still unconscious, start a system where we would actually, paramedics will start cooling them down, a therapeutic hypothermia program. Uh, and we have a devices that actually we put a catheter into the, uh, into the their big vein and chill them down to about 90 degree Fahrenheit, uh, 32 degrees Celsius. And that we know uh, prolongs and survival, makes uh, two or three times more people survive a, heart, uh, a, a, a cardiac arrest than those who, whose temperature is allowed to stay normal. So answer to your question, yes, you need to do cardiac massage and uh, if you did nothing else, if the person is unresponsive and you were giving cardiac massage the way I described um, while the paramedics arrived, the, both the circulation and ventilation would be maintained reasonably. Just make sure that the airways are open. 
Thank you, Dr. Dave. Can we all give a big round of applause to our panel again? Thank you so very much. And on behalf of the council, thank you, Susan. Wonderful moderation and the panel. We're going to take a quick five-minute recess. Um, and panel, please be back at uh, 7.30, at uh, 2.35, please. Thank you.
you go. You see our scintillating lady, you said you definitely want to no, stay. Oh, we'll miss you. <laughs> this is Jim, we're back. Okay, the, the meeting is called Back to Order, if that's uh, grammatically correct. And we'll move on to our commissioner reports. Our first report will be Martin on fraud. Oh, yeah. oh, thanks, Jim. You know, every year, more and more people are using the Internet for their shopping. And you can just about buy anything you ever need using that system. You can even get your groceries delivered right to your door. And this is a very useful thing for seniors who find it difficult to get out either because of some physical problem or a lack of transportation. Now, many people are reluctant to use uh, online shopping because they don't like having giving out their credit card numbers over, you know, out over the internet. Well, the credit card companies have come up with a solution for you. It's called a virtual credit card or a one-time credit card. Uh, Citibank actually calls this a virtual credit card, and the Bank of America has something called the Shop Safe. Now, I'll describe what the Citibank people use. Uh, they will put a program on your computer, and when you need to shop, use a credit card to shop, you will open up that program, and a screen will pop up asking you for your username and password. And you want to pick a good one, because you don't want anyone else having access to the system. I mean, my, my names are 18 characters long. The trick is to be able to remember those characters. Well, when you get on there, you're asked, when you enter your username and your password, the screen will pop up asking you if you want a virtual credit card number. And you will say yes, because that's why you're there in the first place. And a picture will come up on the screen. It will look just like a credit card. And a number, a little number will appear there that's randomly selected. It will also have an expiration date. And you know that little secret three number code that's usually in the back of your card? It will be one of those numbers too. And your name will even be there. You enter that information in the appropriate boxes on the vendor's uh, screen that he's given you, and you can actually just drag the number using your mouse right into the box. Now, this number is only good for that one purchase. You cannot use it a second time. Therefore, if anybody steals the number, it does them no good at all. And you can't even use it a second time. So it's not really any good for something like a monthly uh, renewable subscription, for example. But yeah. <laughs> Once, <coughs> but you are absolutely safe using it. And it will appear that once this purchase will actually appear on your regular credit card statement. You don't get a new statement or anything like that. So is, is, are all banks doing this as far as you know? As far as I, I've only found, I've only, I only know the Citibank, the Visa card or MasterCard, they oh. use it. Okay. Bank of America has one. I'm not familiar exactly with how theirs work. But, uh, and I don't know about Wells Fargo. But the concept's the same. It's a one-time only type of... Uh, it's only one time. You cannot use it a second time. I wouldn't yeah. try to use it a second Which time. It sounds like it'd be very, very good for large purchases. Uh, I, I use it for just any time. I, I use it everything. Uh, any time I buy something online, I always use that okay. method. Okay. You know, if it's a single purchase, of course. Okay. Thank you, Marty. I've even used it when I had to have two numbers. Like sometimes you had to use it, uh, make two purchases at the same time. Yeah. But two separate ones? Yeah, two separate ones. Okay. You just, it's very easy to get the number. Well, one thing we know, there's always something something new, fraud-wise, and uh, the frauders seem to be able to stay ahead for the most part of, of most of us, so this, this kind of information is vital. Okay, we'll move on to um, legislation, the gerontology education changes. Commissioner Fotheringham. Okay. If... Uh, you ever felt insulted because your physician told you that uh, your medical problem was that you were getting older, 
uh, or if you've searched in vain for a gerontologist in uh, Caneo Valley, uh, there may be a little bit of good news for you in a new piece of legislation that took effect the first of this year, um, and that is um, a legislation that uh, requires any physician for whose uh, patient population is represented by 25% or more people over 65, uh, that physician is now required to uh, take 20% of their continuing education uh, courses in geriatrics or a closely related field. Uh, the trick now is figuring out which physicians have patients uh, who are primarily uh, out of 65 years or older, uh, uh, age or older. That, thank you, Nick. Okay, uh, programs. Um, Commissioner Graham, would you tell us about our March program? Yes, Jim, thank you. Uh, the Council of Aging will again continue the use of this panel presentation to highlight key specific and germane issues to senior living here in, in the Canae of the Thousand Oaks. Following the volunteer presentation of last month and this month's uh, Heart Healthy, uh, March will have panelists who are involved with the transportation system here in Thousand Oaks and in Ventura County. Um, it's important that we bring these, uh, the ideas and the requirements of the systems uh, for transportation here in the community for seniors to the forefront every once in a while to update, review, as well as you know, see some of the things that are going to happen in the future with our transportation system. Uh, this will deal with our fixed transportation, the buses, as well as dial-a-ride. The panelists will be members who are directly involved with the functioning future, present, and as well as future uh, operation of these systems. So I ask everybody to bring your questions to and come to our presentation. Meet the folks who are actually involved that you can get some answers from them uh, to some of your questions on transportation. Uh, thank you, Jim. Super. So right back to you, Dave. Uh, you, there's a VCTC commission meeting that you were going to tell us uh, tell us a little about. Yeah, it's sort of um, appropriate that uh, we're going to have our transportation presentation in March. Uh, there's been an ongoing effort by the Ventura County Transportation Commission to determine the unmet needs of not just seniors but anybody in the uh, Ventura County. This commission will have their last public meeting this Monday over at the Camarillo City Hall from 1.30 to 3.30. And again, this is an open forum for folks, whether it's senior issues, ADA issues, or other uh, just general public, um, better understanding of what is available and what can be done to make some changes in the future of the uh, basic public transportation fixed as well as dial -a -ride. Again, that's going to be this Monday at Camarillo City Hall from 1.30 to 3.30. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Dave. Moving on to our Senior Adult Master Plan, Commissioner Silverberg. Thank you, Jim. Uh, the implementation teams uh, for the Senior Adult Master Plan, uh, all six areas, uh, are hard at work. Uh, just to remind everyone, it's housing, health, transportation, recreation, volunteering, and assistance. Uh, today we will hear a progress update from two of these teams, first the assistance team and then recreation. Uh, for assistance, uh, I, my pleasure to introduce uh, Carol Freeman, who is the uh, team leader. Uh, Carol has been involved with the senior master plan uh, right from its inception, from uh, the development of it uh, and since 19, it's in 2007 and eight. Uh, and uh, she heads that group, and uh, the uh, Council on Aging advisor for that is uh, Commissioner Shentis. Without further ado, uh, Carol, please. 
Thank you, Mel. And it's nice to see everybody on Council on Aging and uh, folks here in the audience, a few less than before. And I'll give a particular commendation to those walking, uh, watching rather from home. Thanks for taking your time and interest in watching. Uh, as Mel said, I'm president of Senior Concerns here in Thousand Oaks and uh, have been a longtime resident of Thousand Oaks. And I chair the assistance committee for the Senior Adult Master Plan. I tell my friends that the reason I work at Senior Concerns is so I can be sure I prepare a place for me because I know I will need it eventually. And it's the same reason I volunteer to work on the Senior Adult Master Plan. During the analysis in my first involvement, during the analysis of those surveys, um, it was noted that many times the suggestions or the, the requests that we would see in those surveys those res for resources already existed somewhere in the community and yet the people weren't accessing, weren't aware of them, didn't get to use them. The most regrettable uh, lament that we hear when we help somebody at Senior Concerns, and I say this frequently also, is why didn't we know about you sooner? Well, we've been around for 34 years. We're very active in the community. You'd think we'd be known and yet we're not or not, maybe, when someone needs us. The situation kind of then says those seniors and those families are going to suffer uh, longer than they need to suffer. Several factors play into this. First one is just human nature. I'm not going to bother to know something or remember it until I really need it. It's just a fact. The other factor that probably plays into it even more so um, is limited resources of nonprofits. Most of these services are provided by nonprofits. The resources are limited, both in terms of staff time to get out and talk to the whole community, and certainly in terms of dollars. Simply put, we probably will not be buying a $3 million for 30 second advertisement at the Super Bowl on Sunday. Could we reach millions of people? Will I be watching? Yes. But need I say more? There isn't that kind of money in the nonprofit world to do that. How do we get a sustained effort to keep the message out there for those people who need whatever service it is? There were five recommendations made, and our committee has established a priority for those recommendations, so I'll give them briefly. I've provided you, um, council members, a summary of uh, our current status for those recommendations. So. Um, on your paper, they're not listed in priority order. You'll have to look for the priority number next to them. But the first one is really back to that. The most important thing we need to figure out how to do for implementation is public education about re existing resources and look at a combination of um, nonprofits, services, and businesses that also provide some of those social services. The second one follows right along with that, coordinating outreach and publicity that already exists and looking at the use of TOTV or other access points where people don't have to come out to see where we are. One fairly unfamiliar uh, recommendation that we are following up on and, and is becoming our first one is the use of 211. And I've given each of you, and there's some cards over here on the side, um, 211 is a telephone number just like 911. It is a nationwide effort. Ventura County was, one, was the first county in the state of California to institute such a program. It is a uh, live people answering a telephone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They have a huge database of every nonprofit agency in the county. It's not just for seniors, it's for anyone. Um, when you reach that number, someone's going to not solve your problem for you, but give you access to points where you might go find that solution. So we find that 211 will probably be our main starting point for the following reasons. It is immediate, it is achievable, it is no cost, and it can be done within a month at least the initial effort. So we've revamped our priority a little bit and, and we'll be looking at 211 as, as our major first effort. The trick will be how do we sustain that awareness for 211 thereafter? And that's the devil's in the details. 
Uh, the next priority is a system that we rank number four is just a system for finding additional funding uh, to nonprofits to provide additional assistance. And then the last one we think is going to be our most difficult to really figure out how to do. And we're looking at some other model programs, and that is to establish a trusted referral source for, I'll call them, home repairs, um, even with that caveat of reasonable expense. We are still early in our implementation uh, for those other four, uh, other than the 211. Um, I, I want to commend the people on the committee and, and mention them in case somebody knows them, because these are folks who are volunteers, and they come from their own businesses and give their time aside from their business. So George Jones is owner of the Home Helpers. Uh, here, in, here in the Conejo Valley. Marianne Knight, owner of California Senior Living, which is a free uh, telephone and on, uh, online um, referral source also for assistance living and, and residential care. Patricia Schiano is a full-time, I call her retired, uh, retired full-time volunteer, I think she is. Debbie Lee is manager of Wells Fargo Home, Home Mortgage. Peter Faza is also a community volunteer, and Barbara Brown is loaned to us from the Thousand Oaks Westlake Chamber of Commerce. These folks are all volunteers who are working outside their normal jobs. We could use more committee members, so give me a call. This will be my plug. Uh, there is a lot of work to do. We have our very first step that we think will be easy to achieve, um, but there's a lot more work to do to really developing a, a four the most critical factor we're looking for is a sustainable action plan, implementation plan. So if you have marketing skills, you have time, or you just have an interest, or you'd just like to see what the inside of Senior Concerns looks like, we meet on uh, once a month over at Senior Concerns. Call me, get in touch with Council on Aging, uh, look for it on the city website, we'd be happy to have you. The master plan that you guys all started a couple, three, I don't know how many years ago, Mel, but a few years ago. Uh, I look at as being a promise from one generation to the next one, so keep it up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carol. And uh, uh, Carol is a uh, obviously a full-time executive director at Senior Concerns, and so she, uh, we thank her for the fact that she's able to give us this time. Uh, thank you much. And I should have asked if you have questions. Oh, oh, I know I was you. very complete. Thank you. There's Andrea. Here. A lady in the, in the You've been asking everybody to call you. Why don't you give your phone number? Oh. oh. <laughs> sure. Uh, telephone number at Senior Concerns for 805-497-0189. Four nine seven zero one eight nine. Senior concerns. You can look it up. Find our website too. Thanks, Andrea. Other question. Thank you again. Yeah, Jean. Yes, uh, Carol. Uh, I have the name of a person who is very interested in serving on your committee. Oh, wonderful. I'll meet you afterwards and and share that with you. Thank you. Uh, we, we Now it is. Thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce our second speaker, uh, Susan Bishore, who is the team leader for the recreation uh, team, and uh, she will update the progress of the recreation team. Susan was formerly with the Canaria Unified School District uh, as an employment specialist, and uh, uh, she's retired, and we're happy to have her on our team. Thank, Thank you, you Mel. First of all, I just want to make it clear. Do I need to give my phone number to out to everyone? <laughs> yeah, little little joke there. Yeah, that's right. Give uh, give Andreas at the Global Center. I can definitely do that. Um, thank you very much. The program today was terrific. Thank you so much uh, for for developing that. I think uh, the information was. Um, um, just prime for everyone in Thousand Oaks to hear. 
The uh, Recreation Committee members are excited about being a part of planning the future rec recreational needs for the senior adult population of Thousand Oaks. Current population estimates that senior adult population in Thousand Oaks will reach 31,000 by the year 2010 which encompasses 25% of the city's total population estimate. With this forecast in mind, it is imperative that all of the committees developed um, as a result of the Senior Adult Master Plan begin now to plan for the future of Thousand Oaks. Our committee, which meets once a month, has five enthusiastic and dedicated members and one terrific advisor from the Council on Aging. We're very excited also to welcome two to three more members to our team this month. Thank you, Jean. Our committee is comprised of a variety of ages, backgrounds, and job experiences. Our past three meetings have been devoted to learning about existing recreational support areas and generating an overall plan in which to accomplish the committee's goals. The recreation section of the Senior Adult Master Plan is responsible for 12 action steps. Our committee has organized these steps into three major areas, and I'd like to go over those areas at this time. The first area is to improve existing services. In order to improve existing services, our committee has recommended that another recreational center be built. The Global Senior Adult Center provides a variety of classes, activities, and services, but it is almost at capacity. Fortunately, Mayor Gillette has announced his support for this project as a priority item. This is one of our high priority items, too, so we will be devising a comprehensive recommendation to the Council on Aging to proceed with this project. Since our committee will be expanding the current programs, classes, etc. developed for the senior population, we will also be looking for alternative meeting sites within the community. Publicizing and marketing these improvements will be coordinated with the Council on Aging's newly founded marketing committee. The major hurdle we and the rest of the committees face is reaching our targeted population. Much of the current senior population is not aware of the vast number of recreational opportunities available to them. The dilemma we face with the baby boom generation is that one, the majority are still employed. Two, they do not know what services they will want or need. Three, they are not ready to be classified as the senior population. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not either. Um, and four, there is not a viable way currently to get that information out to them. Our second area of focus deals with expanding services within the existing organizational structure. Since the baby, baby boom generation will have the greatest impact on recreational needs over the next 10 years, our committee, our committee will be expanding needs expanding current services, excuse me, and developing new programs with a focus on a more active clientele. We will be partnering with local businesses and corporations to increase access and knowledge to the latest in technological advances. Marketing and publicity in these areas will focus on removing the barriers, hopefully, to avoid age discrimination. Our third area of focus deals with expanding services through partnerships with other community organizations. Focusing on a more active future senior population, our committee will need to engage businesses in partnerships in order to meet those needs. Targeted needs include exercise facilities, lifelong educational experiences, and other continuing education educational programs. Examples of partners who can facilitate these needs include local gyms and YMCAs and educational facilities such as the Caneo Valley Unified School District, Caneo Valley Adult Education, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, Cal State University, and Cal Lutheran University. We also hope to partner with our Chamber of Commerce, Realtors, and local businesses to disseminate program materials to seniors and future retirees. 
This will provide an additional avenue to reach the boomer generation, hopefully. The City of Thousand Oaks can be extremely proud of the recreational services currently available to our senior population. They have partnered with the Caneo Recreation and Parks District to provide its residents with the multifaceted Senior Recreation Center, the Global Senior Adult Center, which is second to none. In looking at the, the CRPD, or the Caneo Recreation and Park District catalog yesterday, I counted um, 110 daytime and evening classes offered for seniors, most of which are held at the Global Senior Center, so you can just see right there how um, the capacity is, uh, you know, for, for new classes is, is very much on a limited basis. The center also provides venues for seminars, support groups, special events, travel, sports and exercise, arts and crafts, games, music, dancing. I could go on and on, um, but you all know what's there. Since our committee began meeting in October, we have set priority levels for all 12 action steps and determined the duration period for implementing these steps. We made a recommendation to the Council on Aging to form a new marketing committee to address our needs of reaching and attracting the baby boom generation. The commissioners had already seen the need for this, though, and already had begun the process, so I thank you, commissioners. Um, that in itself is going to be a tremendous asset to all of the committees. Our committee also made a recommendation to change the name of the Goebbels Senior Adult Center to something more appealing for the future active senior population. Our committee continues to discuss more appealing names, uh, such as just the Goebbels Center or the Goebbels Adult, Adult, Adult Center. Um, but we do look forward to working with the Council on Aging on this proposal. At our January meeting, we discussed the need for promoting a survey relating to recreation and healthy living issues, with the target group being the baby boom generation. We will continue to formulate a plan for implementing this. We also continued discussion on our main fo focus area, that of proposing a new senior recreational center. Our preliminary research shows that we are forced to partner with local agencies and businesses to find space for future programs and activities until that time when, when a new facility can be built. After coordinating all of our members' schedules with the, the limited room that's available at the Goal Senior Adult Center, we have confirmed meeting slots now for the second and the fourth Tuesday of each month, 9 o'clock to 10.30 a.m. in the Lilac Room at the Goal Center. And our next meetings are February 9th and the 23rd. So it's been a pleasure so far working on this committee. Do you have any questions? No. Any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you Susan. very much. Uh, as a new volunteer uh, on this program, you're really moving right along. So we, we appreciate everything you've done. And again, I mentioned the advisor for the Council on Aging Advisor is Jean Borgie. <laughs> And uh, we appreciate your effort. It's on. Um, I should mention just briefly, uh, although we're not ha going to have a report from housing, that uh, the housing committee has been active on a uh, team, has been uh, actively pursuing putting together a special uh, survey to further define, better define the uh, the needs of the baby boomer generation. Uh, it will be going out. Others can complete it if they wish. Uh, we, you'll be, it'll be publicized in, uh, in the ACORN, and it'll be on, uh, uh, it'll also be on the website. And uh, just stay tuned for that, and you'll hear more about that uh, uh, as it develops. Uh, I think, uh, again, if you want to volunteer for any one of our the committees that you've heard about or that you've read about, just call 449-2743 uh, or Council on Aging uh, at toaks.org and we'll be uh, happy to, uh, to welcome you and I know the, the teams will be happy to welcome you too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mel. We're running a little late, so let's, uh, let's go to the whip here. Uh, Martin, could you uh, take over the liaison reports, please? Okay. <laughs>
uh, Nick and Mel are our representatives to the Ventura County Area Agency on Aging, and I'm sure they will have a report for us. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Nick uh, Fotheringham does have a uh, report. I'll turn it over to Nick. Uh, thank you, Mel. Uh, the uh, Ventura County um, Area Agency on Aging met uh, one of its uh, bi-monthly meetings in January. Uh, and at that meeting, they had a very interesting 20-minute presentation by Ann Love, who's a representative from the Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, one of the key points, or one of the things that I found more interesting, uh, most interesting about this presentation, um, was the uh, um, at least the claim that we uh, typical senior tends to outlive their driving skill by eight to ten years, and it's a good idea to. Uh, Think about alternative ways of getting around before your driver's license disappears. Uh, so try out uh, dial a ride and the city bus and so forth, alternate ways of getting around using public transportation. Learn to use those before you have to use them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Um, our our uh, next report is about RSVP. And I'd like to announce that in cooperation with the IRS, trained and certified RSVP volunteers are once again providing free income tax preparation services. To qualify, you have to be a senior over 60 years of age, or if you have an income of less than $50,000, your age will not matter. Today is the first day, it's kickoff day, and they provide this service, and the last day will be April the 9th. Uh, on Wednesdays, uh, you go to the Newberry Park Library. Their hours are 9 to 3. And on Thursdays and Fridays, it's at the Global Senior Adult Center from 9 to 4. No appointments are necessary or taken. It's first come, first served. Now, I've been told to announce that do not come too soon. Many times in the last year or so, they found people have their tax returns prepared and sent in and come back a week or two later with one more, 1099 or W-2 or 1098 form. Make sure you have all your forms. You also should bring some, a photo ID and a social security card. You should also make sure you have your social security benefit statement, the SSA 1099 form. Of course, you want to have your W-2s and 1099s. Bring your property tax bill. Uh, any amount, if you received uh, any uh, amount of money last year from the economic stimulus program, I think it was 200 or 500 dollars. Make sure you know about that and bring that in. Bring in a copy of last year's federal and state tax returns. If you are planning on having your uh, refunds uh, direct deposited, bring in your bank routing numbers and uh, account numbers. Anything else you can think about or about income expenses, make sure you bring that with you also. They do not do Schedule E or Schedule C. Otherwise, everything else works. Our final report is from Andrea from, on the Global Senior Adult Center. Well, good afternoon. I hope you can all hear me. I have a slight cold. Um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate a few things, um, definitely on the income tax. Wednesdays is Newberry Park Library, and that's on Borchard Road. We've been getting a lot of calls, and people are confused, so it's Newberry Park Library, Borchard Road. Um, and then, like you said, Thursdays and Fridays at the Global Senior Adult Center. Um, and for those people wondering what... Uh, Martin meant by Schedule E or Schedule C, that's no rentals, so don't bring in any information about your rental income or, or uh, loss from business. They will not do those. So anyway, that's February 3rd from today through the 9th. And if you have questions about that, um, go ahead and, and call 381-2742. Our Retired and Senior Volunteer Program does oversee this at the Global Center for us. So 381-2742 if you have further questions. Uh, some real fun, quick things that are coming up. Um, tonight our professors and pastries are coming back. 
and that's hitched to the universe or ties to wild places. And then February 17th are problems in perspective, income disparities and standards of living around the world. Uh, those are on the first and third Wednesdays from 645 to 845. So just call in, make sure you have a seating reservation because we do limit the amount of seating. Uh, we've got some really good programs. Reversing inflammation to promote wellness. That's going to be uh, this coming Monday, the 8th, from 4 to 5.30. And then we're also repeating it February 24th from 6 to 8 p.m. And that's going to explore the links between inflammation, chronic and degenerative diseases, and premature aging. And uh, we'll give some dietary and lifestyle suggestions to improve inflammation in the body. So anybody out there, I mean, arthritis, uh, some chronic conditions all produce inflammation in our body. So this should be a really informative and interesting one. Again, you'll need to call. Uh, for a reservation. I'll give the number at the end. Social Security every month is coming back uh, from 1 to 2 and 2 to 3. So if you need to sign up for your Social Security benefits or you're retiring or you need to change things or file for disability, um, give us a call. We'll get you on that list. And uh, Monday, February 22nd is another wonderful seminar, Life Choices. You know, what this is, is we've all been faced with life choices, and it's either for ourselves or for a spouse or a friend or um, other relative. So it's going to really focus on, on some different things that, that do come up. Uh, one of them will be advanced uh, directives for health care, uh, choices if for uh, other serious illnesses and Medicare benefits and what's covered, what's not and uh, what hospice can actually do for you, because everybody's always afraid of hospice, but they're an actually wonderful, wonderful organization that provides a lot of things for people. And a fun one coming up, Teen versus Senior 8-Ball Tournament Pre-Qualifier. So our people that are out there playing uh, pool, now this one is for adults 50 plus, so we, we do qualify that one. Uh, that's going to be Wednesday, February 24th, and then... Um, in March will actually be the, the tournament for the teen versus seniors, which is always uh, wonderful to come see and, and watch. And uh, February 27th, a big one. This is stroke prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. And uh, Moving Seniors Forward Network Group is helping to put that on, and along with Medtronic is a sponsor. So they're going to do a complimentary breakfast, and of course some raffles, and they will have uh, Dr. Ronald Zaman speaking about strokes and causes and prevention and treatment once you've had them. So those are some really big things that are coming up. Also, you were talking about driving a little while ago because you had a DMV presentation through Area Agency on Aging. Um, I'm teaming up with our own RSVP and uh, with Carol over at Senior Concerns, and we're going to be doing the Car Fit program coming in April. And that's making sure your car fits you and you fit your car. And you might think this sounds funny, but it's it's really imperative because we you know we all get a little crook in our neck and we can't look backwards as well anymore, and our mirrors need to be adjusted appropriately, our seats need to be adjusted appropriately, our seat belts need to be adjusted. There's actually assistance to help make sure that you can get in and out of your car better. So there's a lot of different things to help keep you driving a little longer, and this is just one of those preliminary things. And uh, so that's going to be a really neat program. That's going to be coming up April 17th, I do believe. So. Start Start looking for flyers and information on that. And uh, May will be another great month as well because we will, I think you already heard, we'll have our Ms. Senior America pageant and we will also have our generation celebration and those are going to be back to back, May 22nd and 23rd. So it's going to be very, very busy. That's all I have. Oops, the other thing for those of you that were listening to get the Global Center, it's 805-381-381. 2744. Those that do like to get on the internet, we do have our site. So it's www.goblesenioradultcenter.org. So just run it all together. And you can even email us at g s as in Sam, a as in Apple, c as in center.org, or at crpd.org, excuse me. So g s a c 
at crpd.org. So you got lots of ways to get us and find our information and our newsletter and all that kind of good stuff. Any questions? Thank you, Andrea. Thanks. Uh, we'd like to apologize to TOT. We're running a little late, but I think this was just a marvelous program. And before we close, I would like to make a special welcome back Harry Norkin statement. God bless you, baby. We're glad to have you back. We've missed you tremendously. And uh, I think you said you'd ha you wanted to say a little something, Harry, so go right ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the good wishes and to all the people who sent me good wishes and help me recover from my recent surgery. I'd also like to send health wishes to Joan Wyckoff, who was a former senior of the year and who went, underwent a heart operation recently. And I'm sure she, she's better known as the birthday lady of RSVP. And our good wishes go to Joan for a good recovery. Thank you. Amen. And with that, this meeting is adjourned.